Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today at the Institute for Safe Medication Practices for the first of three programs in a series dedicated to drug diversion and patient safety. Today, we will start with a program entitled, Diversion is a Threat to Patient Safety, Adopting Best Practices for Safe Management of Controlled Substances. My name is Susan Paparella. I'm a registered nurse and vice president at ISMP, and I will be your host for today's program. We would like to thank Fresenius Kabi for the generous support for this webinar series on such an important topic. We can all agree that drug diversion in healthcare is a serious matter. While statistics suggest that about 10% of healthcare practitioners may be abusing drugs, the extent of the problem is widely unknown because not all of these cases are detected and even less reported. Diversion of controlled substances from health system settings can enable continued misuse by individuals. Drug diversion and impaired practitioners negatively impact patient and staff safety and can result in significant fines to hospitals and health systems for inadequate safeguards. This is the first of the three webinars on this topic where we will explore the often unrecognized risk for drug diversion, as well as the various safety ramifications. Next slide, please. By the end of today's program, as a participant, you should be able to recognize the impact of diversion in the healthcare system and the safety of medication use. Identify nursing practices that support medication safety and eliminate risk for drug diversion. Some additional housekeeping items. This program is being recorded and will be available on the ISMP website. Handouts for today's program can be found using the link provided in the reminder email you received earlier today, as well as in the Zoom chat box. All attendees are in listen mode only during the presentation. Feel free to ask a question by accessing the Q&A or chat functionality on your toolbar. If the speaker doesn't happen to address your question during the program, we will have time at the end for Q&A. So before we start, let me introduce our faculty for today. Our first speaker is an ISMP pharmacist, Christina Mahalik. Christina is a director of membership and leads ISMP's efforts in the joint ECRI and ISMP patient safety organization. Christina is also administrative coordinator for the Medication Safety Officer Society, manages ISMP's targeted medication safety best practices for hospitals, and is ISMP's lead for medication related technology issues. Since joining the ISMP staff in 2010, Chris has been collaborating with healthcare practitioners and sharing best practices through consulting engagements across the US and educational programming at national, international, state, and local levels. Our second speaker for today is Barb Nickel. Barb is a clinical nurse specialist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center College of Nursing, specializing in critical care and vascular access. Her role includes staff development, quality improvement, and clinical consultation. She has published numerous articles on infusion therapy and is chair of the 2022-2024 Infusion Nurses Society Standards of Practice Committee. Complete bios for today's speakers are available on the ICP website. So without further delay, welcome to Christina and Barb. And Chris, can you please go ahead? Thanks so much, Sue. It's a pleasure to be here today with everyone. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Before I get into some specifics, let's first define what we mean by drug diversion. Um, it's best defined really as the diversion of licit drugs for illicit purposes, meaning we're taking something lawful um, and moving it to something unlawful, for unlawful purposes. Um, it's typically movement from medically necessary use to uses that are not medically authorized or necessary. While drug diversion among healthcare practitioners is not a new phenomenon, the recent stressors and mental and physical challenges related to the fallout from 
being a healthcare practitioner during the pandemic present what might be really the tipping point for some practitioners towards illicit use of drugs. Or in other cases, it, it might escalate their existing substance use disorder that could drive them toward diverting medications from their employer. So why, why is it important to discuss diversion? Certainly, we did accept as healthcare practitioners the first do no harm um, process and thought process. And at ISMP, our mission is to advance patient safety by empowering the healthcare community to prevent medication errors. So you can see why this is a topic that's fitting to our mission. In fact, we've received diversion-related reports into our National Medication Errors Reporting Program, as well as we've seen reports in the ECRI and ISMP Patient Safety Organization. Now, a lot of these re reports are related to risks for diversion. There's also been some that were actual diversion events, documented diversion events. We know that the United States and Canada have the highest per capita consumption of opioids. And as such, and you might expect, have um, high opioid related mortality. And although opioids are one type of controlled substances, they are ones that are typically diverted from healthcare organizations. It's sometimes hard for people and, and those of us that are healthcare practitioners to believe that diversion can be occurring in our organization. In fact, I think that a lot of people are in denial. Um, you know, no news is good news until it actually happens to them or close to them. I think people are more likely to believe this is a problem that's more common in the general population. So, so diversion is a threat to patient safety. It's also a threat to patient privacy. Patient records might be inappropriately accessed to identify opportunities for diversion. It's also a threat to occupational health as we have higher risks of opioid related substance use disorder. Um, and it's a threat to compliance with regulatory requirements and it can also result in legal actions for organizations and individuals. Next slide, please. So um, diversion affects certainly more than just the diverter. We have patients who may suffer they, because they have incomplete or insufficient therapies. Um, maybe their analgesia isn't controlled or their anesthesia. Um, they also can have care compromised due to their care provider trying to care for them while impaired. Depending on the drug and the method of diversion, patients may also be at risk for infection. And I know Barbara will share some of those risks with you in her portion of the program today. Um, in fact, in between the years 1983 and 2018, there were over 200 cases of outbreaks associated with drug diversion in the US. Um, and those outbreaks reveal gaps in, in prevention, detection, and response to diversion, which I'll, I'll talk about some strategies as I move forward in my portion of the program. But the practitioners involved were varied, and it's important to know that um, they were nurses, nurse anesthetists, surgical technicians, radiology technicians, pharmacy technicians, and respiratory therapists. So it, it's not really limited to one particular practitioner type. For healthcare workers, um, the most severe risk, of course, is one of overdose or death. Um, they could also cause harm to others, and they could be subject to licensing issues, criminal prosecution, um, and malpractice lawsuits. For hospitals and health care practices, systems, health systems, pharmacies, you know, they have a number of risks that could include financial issues, like the, even just the cost of lost drugs, drugs that are diverted that can't be used on patients. Um, they also have to manage investigations, which can take a lot of human resources and time. And that might include testing and possible follow-up care for affected patients. 
They also could be subject to fines and legal fees as well as settlement costs. For the public, you know, there's that loss of trust in the organization as some of this information gets publicized and the community of the or where the organization is can perceive just this failure for whatever, if it's a primary practice site or it's a hospital or pharmacy, it, they perceive that failure for that organization to control and regulate these drugs and how that's contributed to misuse. Um, which is disheartening. So how do organizations prevent diversion of drugs, particularly controlled substances? Well, first we need to understand that diversion can occur and that we need to put safeguards in place that's going to help us to detect diversion. Um, in the article that I have referenced on this slide, the authors noted that 79% of Canadian hospitals controlled drug loss reports were categorized as quote unquote, unexplained losses, which suggests a lack of traceability, which we really need to understand more about the root causes of how those things happen in order to prevent that. And those same authors also cite a case in a single United States endoscopy clinic that showed a $10,000 loss of propofol that was unaccounted for over a four week period of time. Now, it, every loss may not be equated to a diversion case, but it certainly speaks to the potential signal of diversion. And it demonstrates that we as practitioners can do better to improve use of, of controlled drugs and those drugs that are typically diverted. Next slide. This is a graphic of a typical medication use pathway. Um, it, this is a pathway that's followed in, in several different healthcare settings, but typically hospitals. And that's where I'm going to focus my comments today. Throughout the process, there's multiple vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the system that really could be exploited by someone who's trying to divert medications. There are some common threads that we've learned about from publicized cases of diversion. And just, just a couple, these could include falsifying records, um, falsifying documentation, swapping out drugs for other fluids, um, often saline, but not always saline, could be a different kind of medication that could also cause a different type of harm, such as a beta blocker. Um, it's diversion can typically be more easily identifiable um, when, depending on the mechanism, but some it can be just very overt in that people just steal. Um, they just just theft without any type of cover up. Next slide. For the purpose of the discussion today, as the first webinar in this series of three webinars, I'm going to be reviewing diversions threat to patient safety in these first five stages of the medication use process, procurement, storage, distribution, and preparation and dispensing. And then I'll hand the program over to Barbara, who's going to share some more specific cases of diversion um, that's led to patient harm, some governance guidance for nursing, um, the prevalence and impact of COVID-19 on diversion, and she'll sum up with some prevention strategies focused on that administration phase of the medication use process. Next slide, please. I'll start by talking about practices that support medication safety and eliminate risk for divergent in the procurement phase. The, here, there's three key areas to consider, who can purchase controlled substances, how they're received, and what's the process for products that are selected for purchase. At this stage, an example of how somebody might divert could be ordering additional drugs or ordering more than what's needed and then destroying the paper trail if there is one. Another mechanism could be if a single person controls both the ordering and receipt of controlled substances. And also here, product selection can be a contributor. If we're selecting products and package sizes that are in excess of what we may need, 
in order to prepare medications that could be a potential risk for diversion. Now, there are some safeguards that could be employed here. First, we want to limit the number of individuals for whom we give authorization to purchase controlled substances. Then when those products arrive to the organization, have a different person from the one who ordered them receive them. And also consider rotating these responsibilities so that we don't have the same team performing these two functions, if you can. During receipt, expect that the individuals are gonna verify what's been delivered against what's been ordered and that gets documented in your records, whether your records are paper or electronic. And periodically audit the process. It's good if you can get somebody from outside the receiving department to do the audit. It's, it's better to have those outside eyes and then take a step further by reconciling what's been billed. Think about that propofol example I gave. After receipt and reconciliation, there shouldn't be any delay in getting the products into your secured storage. And ideally, if you have a third person or another individual, have them take that final step. Again, introducing different people in the process. Thinking about product selection, there's really three things to consider. First, we want the best, the best product would be one that's really ready to use. Um, one that doesn't need to be manipulated in any way and one that doesn't require any waste um, during preparation and, and eventually during administration. Thinking down further through the medication use process, it is better to purchase different sizes or doses of a product if you know for a particular drug you're going to use a variety of doses. Um, alternatively, some organizations might have the philosophy that we, if we purchase a larger size, it's going to satisfy more doses in the dose range, and that's going to limit the variety of inventory that I need to keep on hand and monitor. However, it really does put us at higher risk if you do that, because um, the majority, if the majority of patients aren't going to receive that higher dose, you're automatically giving practitioners more drug than that's needed. And it's going to require waste. Um, and it's also a safety risk because there's risk that that full package is going to be administered to the patient, whether that's a syringe or a vial, if it's an injectable product. Um, and finally, look for products that have tamper evident packaging. It's difficult to find things that are tamper proof because people are really creative. Uh, but for sure, look for products that have tamper evident packaging. And that's those seals that are break open and are very obvious if, if they're torn open. Um, it's going to make diversion more visible. And sometimes that's the exact trigger for identifying that a diversion is occurring. Um, it could be a series of two or three packages that show signs of tampering. And that's the trigger to do an investigation and dive deeper in. And that might be how people initially recognize that they have a problem. And it's also good to look for those seals when you're doing your, if you do regular inventory, whether it's weekly, biweekly, shift to shift daily, however you do it for your organization, the integrity of those packages should be reviewed. Next slide. In the storage phase of the medication use process, practices that support safety and eliminate risk for diversion really center around the location of storage, how inventory is verified, and how well we separate individual products. The safeguards to consider here are to secure your storage and make sure that the locations are monitored. You can do that a variety of ways. Um, you can monitor access to a locked door that leads to your storage area. You can use camera technology, um, or you can utilize automated dispensing cabinets. Um, additionally, you wanna make sure that the area is limited to only those people that really need to have access. Particularly in the pharmacy department, there may be other storage locations. Maybe you have a secondary or auxiliary storage location where you keep a large volume of drug. Um, it might be something that you've ordered in anticipation of use, uh, maybe something that you know might be in short supply and you wanted to have extra of it, but it may not be in the main traffic area or workflow or in plain sight. 
Um, this it becomes a little bit more challenging monitoring these storage locations. Uh, and that really has to be considered in eliminating risk for diversion. Another area in a pharmacy department, particularly in the hospital setting, is where we would have storage of controlled substances for use in the preparation of controlled substance infusions. This might be a smaller supply, um, again, an auxiliary supply of controlled substances. Um, it might be, again, a bit more challenging to keep track of these products, but really we need to ensure that we have that movement documented, that we're verifying that quantity remaining every time that we have movement of these products. And we like to see that verification be a blinded count if you're using paper or a, an automated system. We really don't want to prompt people because it's very easy for us to agree with the number that we're given as opposed to independently verify account. Um, if your organization uses multiple dose bulk packages, um, if possible, avoid storing partial vials or bottles. However, if you can't avoid that, you want to include in your inventory audit, accounting for each milligram or milliliter of those medications. Discrepancy investigation, if you identify one, these really should be elevated to a high level of concern and investigated in an expeditious manner. Uh, discrepancies that originate in the pharmacy could be an indication that perhaps the wrong product's been dispensed to a patient care area, which is another reason to begin the investigation as soon as possible. You may be able to catch a dispensing error before it actually reaches a patient. And the last pr process or practice for storage is um, to consider how you've got your storage configured. There should be clear separation of products, whether it be a different drug or different doses of the same drug to avoid intermingling, which can actually contribute to incorrect inventory verifications and counts, which could delay the identification of a potential problem. Next slide. Distribution practices that support medication safety focus on four aspects, um, PAR levels, the replenishment process, verification and how we return items to stock. The first process, PAR levels, I think sometimes the importance of this is underrated. If one of your foundational, one of your foundational strategies really should be to define PAR levels for each controlled substance and each dose or size of that product, and then monitor compliance with those PAR levels. This is really, it's good inventory practice, but it can also be good practice for eliminating a risk for diversion. If you set up a PAR level and practitioners are constantly exceeding that PAR level, it's a trigger to investigate why. Um, if you recognize that practitioners are ordering more than what's that agreed upon volume um, and you believed it's appropriate for use, great. Um, if it, you can't identify appropriateness, then that's your trigger to investigate further. And this is, useful whether you have automated storage or non-automated methods of storage and accountability. The second process um, is replenishment, and the goal here is to maintain that chain of custody. So your processes should include documentation of removal from one storage location area, let's say that's the pharmacy, and then arrival at the second, the next storage location. So that might be delivery and receipt to a patient care area. And that process should be reviewed and audited to make sure that that's occurring. Um, sometimes that could be through a report, other times it could be actually um, physically going to an area and verifying that. Um, in the event that you have a care area that uses manual count records and you're maintaining that running count of your inventory, that should be audited. That math should be audited so that it all makes sense. For example, if um, someone documents that they have given a patient um, one dose of something or they've removed one dose for a patient, um, the math should not show a subtraction of two. Sometimes that's a way that people can um, 
get by without being noticed because nobody's actually doing that math. And then taking that a step further, you want to have verification that they match from day to day and week to week and shift to shift. And finally, for distribution, there are times when we might remove something from a stock location with the intention of administering it to a patient, but then recognize we don't need it. Maybe the patient refuses it. Um, if you have automated dispensing cabinets, we don't recommend that you have practitioners return those products right to the pocket. Um, we like to see those products return to the pharmacy so that they could go back through the verification process and pharmacy controls that movement. Um, at this point, there also should be that integrity check of the product. I mentioned the tamper evidence seals. If a tamper evidence seal or package has been removed, um, this is a risk to put this product back into stock. And we also want practitioners to recognize that tamper evident packaging as a good to go sort of um, mindset that if I don't have it, I should worry. So um, we would recommend that they don't get reused. Next slide. Um, looking at preparation, there are two practices here that support medication safety and one is repackaging and the other is compounding. As I mentioned prior, if at all possible, it's best if you can avoid storing partial packages of controlled substances. But if you are repackaging oral solids or liquids, try to repackage the entire bottle of the drug to avoid leaving those partial packages where you would need to account for the milligram or milliliter left of that drug. Um, you also might wanna consider instituting your own form of tamper evident packaging here when you repackage. But of course, um, you have to keep in mind that those tamper evident packages need to be controlled as well. You don't want the situation where somebody can actually take one off and replace it with something that's very easily accessible. A strategy for sterile compounding would be to try and build your master formulation records for compounded sterile preparations so that you don't have waste. If you're compounding controlled substances, you might be able to have an expectation about what that routine amount of overfill is in perhaps a vial and use that to your advantage. But if you can't do that, when you build your master records, Build in that expectation for waste and have your pharmacists and pharmacy technicians prompted to document that waste. Um, we typically have, uh, this is the last piece in preparation, we typically have a verification step when we are measuring a liquid, whether it's an oral liquid or um, an injectable liquid controlled substance, um, we have somebody verify that we have the right amount. But where we might not have thought about a verification is if we're actually preparing a preparation from a powder. Um, maybe it's, it's a non-sterile compound and there's a weighing step in that process. We wanna make sure that there is verification of the amount of product that's been weighed. And sometimes we miss that point. Next slide. Although I focused on practices that we see in hospital pharmacies primarily, I really would be remiss if I didn't mention prescription dispensing. Um, in addition to ISMP's medication error reporting program, we also have a consumer reporting program and consumers send us events. And I have three examples on this slide here, and these are taken directly from reports. Um, this is the patient's language. And all three of these examples are showing issues with the amount of drug that's been supplied to patients. And they're all situations where the patient has been shorted. So um, if you are listening and you work in an outpatient pharmacy, Think about your processes for verification of controlled substances prior to dispensing them to patients. Many of the same strategies that I've talked about today would also support medication safety and eliminate risks for diversion in your setting. And then before I hand it over to Barb, I just want to talk about a couple other safety risks. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the best practice 
is to avoid waste. But if you do have to have waste, have an expectation defined of how you want that to happen. Practitioners should actually be seeing something, witnessing something that's being wasted. Um, you might not be able to have them verify every time exactly what that content is, but when you build and define your processes, they should at least be seeing something. Secondly, patient lists. Um, if you have in particular automated storage locations, these lists should be as limited as much as possible. There is risk where you have um, a patient's name appearing on a list that's not being cared for in that area. Um, it's not necessarily a, a patient that we might have a, a lot of focus on. So it would be uh, another mechanism for people to be able to remove something that might go on fall, fly under the radar for a period of time. Um, so where you can limit the lists to only those patients being treated in that area. Controlled substance infusions while they're infusing are also a risk. If you're not already utilizing some form of tamper evident cover or case, you should consider that. Um, it, it really serves two purposes to protect diversion from healthcare practitioners, but also it can help detect diversion from patients or patient families. Sometimes these are integrated with infusion pumps. If they're not integrated with the pump, there are some products you can buy um, that are disposable and again, would serve that purpose of, of sort of being that trigger. Another thing is to be mindful of care areas that may close due to capacity issues and the controlled substances that have been distributed to that area. Um, even if you have automated storage, a carrier care area that's not in use is more difficult to maintain oversight of those controlled substances. Also, um, have a plan for hardware and software downtime. You know, consider how well you're able to limit access in those situations. And this might be a really good opportunity to do a tabletop exercise with the practitioners who would be affected by either a hardware or a software downtime of an automated storage unit. And then um, last on this slide is staff turnover. It's really important to uh, monitor this, um, particularly uh, with automated storage. And as practitioners assignments are modified, um, or change, and also where staff separate from the organization. You want to make sure that their access is up to date with um, their practice setting and if they're and removed as appropriate if they've left the organization. And next slide, please. Patients okay. own supply of controlled substances is another challenge. It can be a bit difficult to manage. If at all possible, it's best to avoid it. Um, however, if you should probably plan that this could occur, um, especially that it might be a rare occurrence and develop um, and test a plan in that situation to make sure that you can maintain that um, accountability. And what you wanna avoid is really a questionable or undefined process um, because loose management can really shine as an opportunity for people who are looking to divert. I mentioned chain of custody earlier. Um, this is something to include in your audit list and think of chain of custody from procurement all the way through to administration. Handoffs between practitioners is another, another risk point. Um, you don't want staff to determine how this should happen on their own. You want to make this an organizational defined process and you should observe the process to ensure that staff are able to follow it. Make sure at some point, you're actually um, taking your audit to the patient record and seeing doses that were documented and, and administered to the patient, um, comparing that to what's been removed from whatever stock location you've had the controlled substances in and then waste where the waste would have been needed. Um, in a lot of cases, this is an onerous process and you may only be able to provide a sampling. However, it's a good practice, even if you can only do um, a few cases of it just to to, again, as a screening. I talked a lot about pharmacy processes. Um, I do wanna mention that you have to consider safe prescribing as well. There should be a process in your system for you to identify inappropriate prescribing 
for unexpected or unusual prescribing around controlled substances. Hopefully you've worked to eliminate things like range orders, which can also open the opportunity for diversion. Um, and also hopefully you're using electronic prescribing and you don't have prescription blanks available for people to um, use. And finally, I'd like to emphasize the importance of staff education and resources to help understand staff understand their risks. Um, likely, the, these are, are we care about our patients, we care about our coworkers, and if there's an opportunity to intervene to prevent an error or to provide help, we want to make sure that we highlight that to our staff because often these are the people that are right there on the front line who are going to be the first ones to see those triggering events. So with that, I'd like to call Barb to the microphone and she'll take over. Thank you, Chris. I'm Barb Nickel. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. And my role in this talk is to speak to the nursing uh, perspective and also the Infusion Nurses Society Standards of Practice perspective. I was a co-author of uh, the 2021 standards. And so we'll bring those forward. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with a case scenario that really highlights the complexities, the vulnerabilities in uh, drug diversion uh, and how it can occur and cause significant patient harm. So in this particular state, the Division of Public Health Service was notified of four new hepatitis C infections in the area. They did a quick investigation and found a commonality in the fact that three of them had been patients at a cardiac cath lab in the area and one of them was a technician employed there. They did additional testing of over a thousand patients that had a procedure at that cath lab and found a total of 32 that were infected with the same strain. So then the deeper dive uh, it found evidence of drug diversion by this particular drug tech in the fact that there were chain of custody gaps. Uh, in particular, in this particular reference, and my references are all included in these slides, um, what they found was that fentanyl would be drawn up in preparation for the next case left on a surface unsupervised. This tech would then slip into the room without anyone in the room, actually inject it into himself, replace that with saline unbeknownst to anyone else. And so again, that is the uh, path of many of these infections. Uh, they found higher fentanyl use in the procedures where there were confirmed cases. They found record that this tech was present in at least 31 of the 32 cases where infection was confirmed and staff when uh, interviewed then said yes we did notice some strange behavior he was in areas where he wasn't really needed to be uh, and so again those came out then in the further investigation you can go into the next slide so this is a chart from one of those references i have two actually in the reference list that uh, refer to this particular outbreak and as uh, Chris mentioned, there are many in uh, the literature, but it indicates where his employment began and then the spike in hepatitis, suspected, probable, and confirmed cases in the area. Uh, unfortunately, this gentleman had been employed by 15 other hospitals in a seven state region. Prior to this, he was a traveler and also an unlicensed technician, so did not have access to controlled substances in his scope but was uh, allowed to based on poor practices from the people around them. Uh, so they did a multi-state investigation, found additional cases of that they felt were related. He eventually did uh, admit to the diversion, was sentenced to 39 years in prison for tampering with a consumer product and obtaining controlled substances by fraudulent purposes. So again, this really shows significant patient, patient harm uh, from poor safe or poor medication administration practices. You can go to the next slide. So uh, some of this Chris has covered, so I will not uh, repeat, but there's widely, or there is not a widely accepted best practice or guideline on diversion detection. There are many, many resources that you have to basically individualize your facilities approach based on your resources. There is also not a great educational, a, an evidence-based educational platform and as Chris mentioned, there is a clarion call in the references, in the research, uh, not only to licensed professionals, but to students that are entering into the profession. Uh, so I'm going to focus more on drug addiction because it is um, a huge source of diversion. So that is a chronic disorder characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite adverse consequences. Uh, and again, we'll talk to that in some of the cases that I'll bring up. Drug diversion, as Chris has uh, already defined, again, it's taking a lawful 
use of a drug into an unlawful channel or distribution, and addiction is the number one reason for diversion. So a definition of impaired practice, which is then what we're concerned about uh, when we're not practicing within the scope, within the competencies of a role, this is from the American Nurses Association Code of Ethics, functioning poorly, diminished competence, evidenced, evidenced by work habit changes, job performance, appearances, or other behaviors. Unfortunately, sometimes those are late signs, and uh, the concern has been present for quite a while. And then substance use disorder, that is a diagnosis uh, that I'll use in some of the references and criteria within that, impaired control, social impairment, risky use, pharmacologic criteria. So there is a definite criteria to make that diagnosis. Uh, not surprisingly, medications most often diverted, as mentioned, opioids, with the most frequent being fentanyl with, um, its, um, with its strength and potency. Anabolic steroids, depressants, hallucinogens, stimulants, those are definitely the most common and many, many different methods to do it <clears throat> in the literature, um, a secret pocket within a uniform where a nurse might give part of a dose and then stash the rest. And rather than actually truly waste it with someone, uh, inject it and then go to a coworker and say, hey, can you zero dose this? I did dump it out in the room, but can you, can you just verify that I did that? That obviously is a practice that should be um, not allowed, discouraged. Um, falsifying records, as Chris mentioned, but patients and families can also do this. <clears throat> if a product is left unsecured on a counter, or in one case, the nurse lost track of her patient control analgesic keys, the patient found them and was able to divert out of um, that device. You can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> so again, Chris has mentioned uh, the cost of drug diversion. I'll just highlight a couple of things here and build on that. Uh, so again, patients are at considerable risk uh, for inadequate care. One of the references mentions a nurse that frequently diverted in an ER setting and was even heard to tell a patient that he needed to man up before a painful procedure because uh, you know, the pain medicine wasn't going to be enough, understanding that uh, she had diverted some of that medication. So we're going to talk to some of those behaviors uh, that really are antithetical to nursing. There's also the adverse reaction if they divert and then replace it with a different medication. And so who, who knows what has been delivered? So again, considerable risk to our patients. Uh, with respect to the healthcare worker themselves who diverts, and Chris has mentioned these, but there's fear of a criminal record, there's malpractice actions, and to the extent, not just overdose deaths, but another case of an unlicensed professional, uh, it was a nursing assistant <clears throat> who would come to work with a rolling suitcase, and uh, not really mentioned because it happened every day, but she would pull that into the, me the med room when there was no one around, take the sharps container off the wall, must have had a wide mouth, which is not recommended, dump those all into this rolling suitcase, later take it into a, a quiet place like a soil hold, and she would then divert uh, the waste in that particular area. Unfortunately, one of the un unmarked syringes in this particular one was uh, a paralytic instead of a narcotic, and she was found dead. So again, huge, um, devastating impact from diversion. The coworkers may contribute to it, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, very clear case that if they have some knowledge and there's uh, consequences if they fail to report that. There's also stress to the added workload if they are either covering for someone who is impaired or having to do extra load or uh, for either the person that's not doing quality care or suddenly disappears off the unit. And then I believe Chris has covered the facility, the healthcare costs. And I've got a quote here, estimated upwards of $25 billion. That of course, is difficult to really truly estimate. And then perspectives of nursing, um, there is a definite um, loss of patient trust, uh, public trust, as uh, these cases are made known. You can go to the next slide. So the governmental uh, guidance and governance, uh, the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 is really foundational. The Drug Enforcement Agency, of course, is the enforcement arm. Joint Commission, CDC have oversight here, as well as Americans with Disability Act, especially when a professional may enter into recovery. Uh, the Medicare conditions of participation, they state that we must provide safe care for patients, prevention of tampering, substitution, and also that surveillance for infection risks. So again, those are very important uh, governance um, 
established uh, around this area. And then within nursing profession, the Nurse Practice Act outlines how we protect the health, safety, and well being of our state's residents. And then our State Board of Nursing has the regulatory oversight for that Practice Act and authorization to discipline if there's violations. And again, from ANA Code of Ethics, a clear statement, nurses must protect the patient, the public, the profession from potential harm when practice is impaired. And then the INS standard really pulls on that ethical principle and the fact that diversion really is antithetical to nursing. It is uh, not uh, in support of the statement where ethical principles are the foundation of who we are as nurses we advocate for the patient, we maintain safety, uh, we promote their dignity and their autonomy. And so again, uh, these are important guidelines that we need to adhere to. You can go to the next slide. So the prevalence within nursing, this is a qualitative study at the top in the call out. These were nurses within a substance, substance dependence unit um, and study, and it was an anonymous survey in Canada. 91.5% of them had active substance dependence and were in current working positions, but that was not known by their employer or regulator. So nationwide prevalence substance abuse definitely is increasing. Uh, opioids, again, highest, as Chris mentioned, and that despite, and it's paradoxical, that we have universally inadequate pain control, especially in these two areas uh, in North America, urgent need to effectively prevent, reduce misuse of drugs, and yet still provide adequate pain management. And that's, that's really a quandary, a paradox within healthcare. So estimated 15% of healthcare professionals are impaired or recovering, whereas in nursing, substance misuse, abuse, addiction may be as high as 20%. Uh, other studies say it's near the general population, somewhere around 10 to 15, but I do believe that it's probably been um, just conflated by COVID, and we'll talk to that here shortly. Uh, does include a high percentage of those prior to entry into nursing profession. And we definitely have to, uh, we have a, an opportunity to really mine that and understand how can we prepare those professionals better before they get into nursing so that they're, uh, they have added resilience. Um, this is another anonymous survey from a peer, peer health assistance program, not just substance abuse, but also emotional, uh, psychological trauma treatment 48% of them in this survey reported drug or alcohol use at work. Only 40% of them felt their competency level was affected, but then they're not necessarily the best judge of that. At least two thirds of them felt the problem could have been recognized sooner, but it typically will not be from these people. And then a study of prevalence of substance use disorder in nursing, only 23% of them felt they needed help but had not asked for assistance. So again, it's not, they are not going to be the ones to recognize it first. You can go to the next slide. So the impact of COVID just briefly, uh, and there really is not a, a great deal of quantitative evidence here, but a great deal of qualitative evidence. And I pulled out some of the phrases that are in this research, forever change, mental health crisis now it, within nursing, the tsunami of death. Uh, so again, a lack of research uh, because there's so much that we need to look at, constantly changing workflows, drug shortages really made tracking of workflows very difficult relaxed restrictions on prescriptions, a uh, weakened support system for highly stressed staff divide, uh, despite the valiant efforts of leadership, perception among nurses that the quality of their care had declined. And for all the patients that we saw dying and their families couldn't be there and they had a tablet in front of them and there was just nothing we could do, develop this psychological trauma, the burnout, compassion, fatigue, which then can create maladaptive coping processes. And there was also increased travel nurses. So many mobile, so much mobility made it difficult to track. Uh, one in particular was a nurse that was from a compact to a non-compact state, and that made investigation very difficult. You can go to the next slide. So I wanna quickly go through this as a chronic illness because that really is the foundation of this. There is a culture, a stigma of negativity. And again, nursing is a very trusted profession. And when these cases come out where we really have done something that betrays that trust, that has a negative stigma. And so again, that, that really creates a culture of silence. The person will likely not step forward, but even colleagues have a fear of exposing a, um, someone that they suspect of diversion. And so that culture of silence is really what shrouds this and makes it difficult. Um, so again, the INS standard speaks to a just culture, not blaming the clinician, but coaching safe choices. 
and on the right, the ANA code of ethics that we need to pr promote a non punitive environment that encourages rehabilitation and recovery. Uh, even the general outlook on patients who are drug seekers, uh, just the chatter that happens on a unit amongst nurses about what we may call a frequent flyer and maybe the frustration of those behaviors that impacts maybe a coworker who has an addiction or maybe is diverting and increases that shroud of silence. So we need to find a balance between public protection and then the safety and compassion for the individual and treating it as a chronic disease and also between confidentiality for them so that there's not conversations around the break table, uh, but also a need to reverse the culture of silence. And we'll review this as a chronic disease with primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. You can go ahead and advance. So in primary prevention, we want to uh, identify, or excuse me, prevent the disease. Again, uh, the INS perspective that we need to assure that our clinicians are meeting all licensure requirements, that they're demonstrating proper competency in all of these workflows for safe medication practices. Very, very important. Recommended to do a failure modes effect analysis as a, as a facility to identify vulnerabilities and shore those up likely this will identify areas of vulnerability that maybe were not suspected. And as Chris mentioned, uh, folks that divert are desperate. They have an addiction, a physical need, a chronic illness, and they will uh, definitely exploit vulnerabilities. So we'll look at access, uh, considered a chief causative factor. The stress of the work environment is incredibly important. And again, a call out from a qualitative study. Uh, this was a nurse. Um, and a direct quote from her, I was using so that I could do my job, not just for the sake of using. And so I think we have to really acknowledge how difficult nursing is and has been in the last couple of years, especially. Uh, attitudes, what are the attitudes that are present within staff and that educational need is vast. One that I wanna call out is that pharmacologic overconfidence um, that will lead to some of our secondary um, preventative measures as well but really mining the attitude here and helping our staff to understand what leads to it so that we can prevent it. You can go on to the next slide. So there was quite a bit here that Chris has already mentioned. So I'll just touch on a couple of things uh, and under access the automated dispensing cabinet. Uh, again, she's mentioned the override list, uh, limiting temporary patient access. We need to make sure under removal and administration process, again, biometrics badge access, very important so that it's trackable. Prompt sign out is one that I didn't hear her mention. I know of a facility where a nurse understood who didn't sign out immediately out of the dispensing cabinet. She would slip in and take medications out underneath someone else's sign out. When that was finally discovered, and it took quite a while to discover that, the nurses that didn't sign out were also uh, subject to disciplinary action. Um, so again, she's talked to the dose limitations, which is difficult. I followed some of the chat and it, it really is a balance. It's very difficult but it's hard for a nurse to throw away three quarters of a vial so that she can give a single dose. So again, trying to adjust to the amount of the dose is very important to limit the amount that needs to be wasted. Um, she's spoken to the tamper evidence, but also tamper proof waste receptacles to avoid something like to happen to that nursing assistant, either not removable from the wall, a small neck or uh, the charcoal in the base so that they can't divert from there. Again, following and resolving discrepancies very quickly, the chain of custody is critical so that, again, uh, a case like um, in the cath lab that we opened up with was very important. Optimizing in the upper hand, right hand corner, the work environment, those are um, very, very important initiatives that have many benefits, uh, reducing workplace violence, uh, in reducing work related injuries, that is a huge source of chronic pain that then creates addiction. So again, improving the work environment, and then again, the attitude and education, understanding what attitudes can lead to this um, and assuring that staff can recognize it as clearly as possible. Also that they have clear expectations for their professional behavior and compliance. And why, why, why are these important? Why is it important to sign out? Why is it important that I waste on removal? They need to know the whys so that they can conform and, and do so. Uh, unfortunately, a diversion case then makes them very motivated learners, but hopefully we can prevent first. High risk areas, I think, are uh, logical. High uh, areas where um, controlled substances are used very frequently, but also long-term care, hospice, oncology can be high use 
or high diverting areas. You can go to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to call out the CDC one and only campaign quickly. Uh, one, one needle, one syringe, one time, zero infections. INS pulls on that as well, that content, and also ISMP safe medication practices. I have them listed here. Uh, again, preparing the medication immediately prior to administration, waste on removal, and not altering anything that's commercially available. You can go to the next slide. So secondary prevention is, is rapid recognition and removal of this clinician from the practice setting. So that protects patients, but also facilitates rapid entry into treatment. Uh, may not even detect diversion, but may detect an addiction that can um, precipitate treatment. Understanding the barriers that really is going to prevent this person from stepping forward themselves. They are not likely to admit it. It really is um, pursuing around to, to the people around them to notice deviations in practice and in behavior, because these barriers that I have listed there really will probably prevent them from doing it. They are not likely to admit it until it really has been, it's an unavoidable um, instance of patient harm. Uh, survey of nurses, again, just a, a few chilling ones as we're reaching the end. 25% reported attaining drugs in the workplace, 12% ordered medications for their own use in the EMR, 9% obtained medications from waste in the Sharps container, 8% replaced drugs taken for themselves with other drugs, and only a quarter of them acknowledge putting patients at risk. Again, speaking to that uh, pharmacologic overconfidence and really the um, just the disconnect of how much uh, they are impacting patient safety. So again, under-identified, under-reported, and termination by a facility such as our case at the beginning without reporting passively expands diversion and increases risk broadly. You can go to the next slide. So again, uh, INS reflects on the fact that we need to have accurate documentation. We need to administer commercially prepared solutions without um, altering them at all. We need a, a multifaceted approach to secondary prevention. Uh, we need to divert, uh, review any diversion cases very thoroughly to shore up vulnerabilities. Randomized drug testing may be helpful. It won't detect if they're diverting for someone else. Uh, many facilities have uh, hired a drug diversion officer, which can be helpful. Again, they have to report theft or loss of controlled substances to the DEA, so that would start the investigation. And we've already mentioned that you can do testing. I saw it a little bit in the chat um, to detect if saline has been replaced. Um, automated dispensing cabinet reports are very critical to do on a regular basis to look for abnormalities, but also PRN, as you note that there may be some changes. And so again, those need to be uh, promptly investigated and surveillance over high traffic areas, specifically where the actual injection may happen, storage areas, soil utility. You can go to the next slide. So early recognition, I've spoken to some of these, the work-related issues, if there's been work-related injuries, trauma, um, really following those employees and, and supporting them, understanding what their uh, struggles are. Personally, there is a huge connection between depression, anxiety, chronic pain, and addiction diversion of the nurse. In particular, also history of adverse childhood experiences. Those are things that can be recognized to say this may be a high risk and, and give them some help, hopefully to even prevent or to early recognize. And then behaviors that we've talked about, again, unusual patterns of pain medication remo removal, uh, changes in their work habits, absenteeism. They may disappear from a shift. They may be present when they're not even scheduled. Uh, again, denial, lapses in clinical judgment. Denial is going to be very common. Lapses in clinical judgment, changes in behavior, typically a late sign. So we need to recognize it based on how they function within the uh, work environment. Go ahead to the next slide. And then tertiary prevention. Uh, this aims to reduce the impact of this ongoing illness. Uh, so again, a just culture is critical. The onus really on leadership. Once this person is confronted with a diversion, likely denial is going to be their first uh, impulse, but helping them to understand that if they self-report, they may avoid disciplinary action and then pursue rehabilitation, typically done through a third party contractual agreement with the State Board of Nursing. They have to be removed from practice, undergo treatment, establish sobriety with randomized drug testing, and then enter that program of recovery that should be individualized, very confidential, which can be difficult, and then acknowledge their challenges. Their license is restricted. They may have inadequate insurance coverage. 
Um, again, the shame and the guilt because it is known on their call or with their colleagues if they can't give controlled substances. So really creating a just culture, non-punitive, and a tremendous amount of support from leaders, friends, because we don't want to lose these nurses if recovery is possible. We want to regain them back into employment. You can go to the next slide. And so a summary really, and this speaks to also what, how Chris opened. Uh, diversion is a patient privacy issue, a patient safety issue, occupational health, regulatory compliance, and legal issues. So it is incredibly complex. It is an educational imperative for students, for staff on risk factors and how to recognize it because it is not going to be the diverter that likely steps forward. We need to assure that preventative measures are in place, that workflows are happening on controlled substances, assuring chain of custody. Staff need to understand their responsibility to report and maintain confidentiality. And the alternative to, to discipline programs can be successful, a just culture and assuring that we have evidence-based treatment to allow this nurse to come back into the profession under a safe environment is incredibly important. And so I know we're at the top of the hour. I'm not sure how we'll handle questions, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Barb. And uh, thanks, Chris, for outlining the impact diversion has on healthcare throughout all phases of the medication use process, particularly outlining those pharmacy issues. And, and Barb, for your insights into the numerous ramifications of diversion and as well as prevention and best practice strategies. Um, looking at our time, uh, we do have some questions in our Q&A that um, I'm gonna just try to ask a couple quickly. Um, Chris and Barb, any thoughts on whether discrepancy resolution should be done by a single practitioner? Uh, Sue, I could tell, share that, you know, at at ISMP, when that po that question has been posed to us in the past, we don't think that that is a safe practice. Um, we think that it, it it's again it's a, a single point to a failure. And as I outlined in in my portion of the program, um, you want to build in those redundancies. And having a single person be able to resolve a discrepancy doesn't build in a redundancy. Yes, and I, I would agree with that. And then assuring that discrepancies are handled before the end of the shift. Uh, so that the nurse who was involved is a part of it. Otherwise, it just carries from shift to shift to shift and is not resolved. Great. And then there was a question also posed about handoffs between providers. What's the recommendation? Do you allow for handoffs between providers of controlled substances when relieving one another? Or just should the providers waste and start anew? I did not see that managed within the... Um, the references, but I would, I, again, single dose is the best. Uh, so you're saying basically there's a residual dose, is that right? And that they may right. hand off, or are you talking about an infusion? Uh, it's not specific in the question, but um, I imagine they're talking about a single dose. So that, you, that's what I would using for procedure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So again, the best practice is to give a single dose and waste on removal so that we aren't handing off because again that would be uh, uh difficult to establish a chain of custody but i know that uh, again covid changed so many practices when we had shortages of ppe and what my estimate this is anecdotally that i see is that our workflows have been forever changed um, and that we we really need to reset back to very good basic standard practices i think reevaluate what's going on and where perhaps we've had some breakdown that we're justified by COVID uh, constraints. Great. Well, thank you both. We are out of time, um, but again, I'd like to thank Christine and Barb for joining us for today's program. Uh, this program has been recorded and will be on the ISMP website. We also would like uh, to extend our sincere gratitude to presenting Kabi for supporting this program. And this is a slide here just showing you about the next two programs we have in this series on April 13th about quantifying the holistic costs of controlled substance waste. I know there's a lot of conversation in the uh, chat about wasting. And then also on April 28th, engaging the OR and procedural areas to mitigate risk with controlled substances. Registration for either or both of these programs can be accomplished through the ISMP website and the link can be found on the bottom of this slide and on your handout for today. Um, and thanks again to all of you, our participants, for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your attendance, and we hope to see you next time.
This concludes our webinar.